Um, well, can I first uh, just get a show of hands as to who here has done any economics? So that's sort of most people, but not everybody. Well, that's very convenient because um, uh, I can teach you all about economics, all you need to know about economics in 20 minutes. Um, and uh, we'll start with, uh, with this diagram, which everybody should have, should have uh, received. This is the standard textbook account of how markets work. And basically, when something's very expensive, um, the demand for it is low. People don't want things which are expensive, they want things uh, which are cheap. Uh, and that's uh, symbolized by this line here. As something gets more expensive, uh, people want less and less of it. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a seller, uh, then it's exactly the opposite. You want the highest price you could possibly uh, get, and therefore that's uh, indicated by this line here, uh, where things are, are very cheap, uh, then people simply don't supply very much of it. In other words, shopkeepers won't sell something because they can't make money on it. Uh, and when it's very expensive, uh, then, uh, of course, they're delighted. Now, where these lines intersect is what we call like, equilibrium. Uh, in, in other words, when the supply of something, the, the quantities which people are um, selling, uh, and the demand uh, which people are uh, uh, people wanting these goods or services, uh, when those things equalize, that's called the equilibrium, uh, and this here is the equilibrium price, the price that balances the supply and demand, uh, and that's the quantity uh, that's traded. Now, I want you to take this piece of paper in your hands like that. Would you? <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> Just tear it off. <laughs> You've always wanted to do that, haven't you, right? <laughs> because markets don't work anything like that at all. If you want to know about markets, I'll tell you the place to go. The place to go is China. I went to China some years ago. I went to northwest China. And I think my wife and I were the only white faces in the whole place. And it was a big, big city. And people would stop and, and sort of look, little kids would come out and look at us. They couldn't believe this, these monsters. Um, and uh, I was there, I was at a conference. And uh, I had a problem. My, my trousers had come adrift. The, the, the hem had come adrift. So I needed somebody to sew them up. And I found a little street market. And the street market, I should say, is the street was about half the width of this room. And each side of it, there were all sorts of improvised stalls of one sort and another, just made of bits of bamboo and cloth and, and all the rest of it. And some people were selling things and they didn't even have a stall at all, they just had a, a sheet on the ground. And it was a complete bustle. And you go, the first people, would be selling rice and grain and sunflower seeds and uh, spices and nuts. And then the next one, it would be melons and bananas uh, and ginger and beans and leeks and all sorts of stuff like that. And then you'd have to watch out because it's a very narrow street. And uh, if you heard, heard a bell behind you, well, that was a guy on a bicycle. And he had this big soup terrine. And he was selling soup off the terrine. He was going down the street selling, selling soup. Uh, and then another one rang his bell behind me, and that was a guy with a huge stack of used cardboard. He was in the recycling business, and he went around collecting all the cardboard, and he stuck it on the bottom of his bike, right up to where the ceiling is. Uh, and he would drive along this narrow street. So you had to be very careful. Uh, and then you'd, you'd come across, there would be baths full of fish, like fish, which people would buy in order to eat, uh, and little um, cages of, of chickens. Uh, and, and ducks, and then there'd be a hardware store with rice bowls and brushes and buckets, uh, and then there'd be um, somebody selling underwear, and somebody else cooking and making uh, a lot of smoke and all the rest of it, and, and cooking and selling all this sort of food. Well, you know, you don't, you don't want to ask what it is, you just eat it. Um, and complete bustle. But eventually I found this little store, a little tiny store about this big, and there was a girl in it, red shirt and black hair, and uh, I proffered my, my trousers and uh, uh, you know, showed her what was the problem. And she nodded like this. You know? She wanted to make sure that somebody who was not lucky enough to 
were born Chinese, and therefore it was probably a bit dim, actually understood that she'd understood. Uh, and, uh, and so she took them. And then I thought, well, how much am I going to pay for this, right? Um, and uh, I, so I, I, I sort of said, like that, you know, how much? Because uh, I couldn't speak the language. And, uh, and she held up five fingers. And I thought, five yuan, yes, okay. Well, um, I'm probably being outrageously overcharged, but at the same time, five yuan is nothing to me, frankly, and I could waste an awful lot of time searching around the streets of Lanzhou in order to find somebody else to, to repair my trousers. So I said, yes, absolutely. And I said, you know, how, how long will it take? And she just said, you know, five, so it took me five minutes rather than five hours. And I was right, yes, and, she, and, and see, she got a piece of, it was rather alarming, it was sort of scarlet thread. And I thought, I don't know what this guy <laughs> looked like. But she did a perfect job, and you couldn't see the thread at all, and it was brilliant, and I handed it over to five years, and there was much mutual bearing, and all the rest of it, and the kids were all looking around because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. And fine. And that's the end of a market transaction. That's what a market transaction is all about. So the, the lesson, there are a lot of lessons to learn from this simple transaction. Firstly, markets are everywhere. This wasn't the only street market in that show. Uh, China must have hundreds of thousands of street markets. Markets are everywhere. If they could exist in what was almost then communist China, I mean, they could exist absolutely everywhere. Um, and secondly, uh, I, I think you must take the lesson that our transaction was entirely voluntary. Nobody was forced into this. Um, I got my trousers repaired, she got the money, because both of us ended up better off as a result of the deal. There's a, people sort of think that, well, whoever ends up with the cash must be the one that wins in a transaction. That's not true. Both sides win in a transaction. If they didn't, they wouldn't do it. If I didn't feel that I was getting five yuan's worth of value uh, from my repair, and she didn't feel that her time was worth five yuan, well, in that case, uh, we just walk on and we would, the transaction would never happen. So it's a voluntary transaction and markets, one of the things they don't sort of tell you is that markets are, uh, need voluntary transaction. Both sides have got to be free to walk away from the, the bargain. And it's the fact they can walk away from the bargain that makes markets work. So it's mutual benefit. I was better off, I got my trousers repaired, she was better off, she got uh, some money for her time. And it was cooperation. Um, we were specialists. I don't know anything about sewing. I'm hopeless at sewing. I do write books on economics, and I'm reasonably good at that, I suppose, uh, because people publish them. And uh, they give me some money, which I then spend on people to repair my trousers, rather than me doing it myself. Just as I spend money on going out to restaurants because I can't bother to cook. Uh, and so restaurateurs, you know, my local Italian restaurateur can spin dough like that. I would never have a hope of spinning dough like that. It would take years to learn that. But we specialise, and I do my thing, uh, the restaurateur does his thing, and we exchange uh, voluntarily, and then we're both happy. And of course the remarkable thing is, this is again what, oh, I'm sorry, I've torn it up now, but uh, this uh, diagram doesn't tell you. Because in that diagram, what? What the textbooks tell you is that all buyers and all sellers are all the same, that, um, that they're identical, that they're, it's a perfect market, everybody's equal, uh, uh, that buyers are all the same, selling the same goods uh, to, to the same sorts of people. It's not true at all. The only reason why exchange happens is because there are differences between people. It's because I'm useless with a needle and thread, and presumably my friend in Lanzhou was not very good at writing economics books in English, that we were able to do this transaction. Um, if I could, if I could sell, I'd have done it myself. But the curious thing is that it's the bigger the differences are between people, is the more likely that exchange is going to happen. If you are really different, you know, if you value things really differently, it's like, you know, kids swapping um, 
uh, you know, these card games you know, where you collect cards, or, or just swapping toys in, in, the, in the playground. In, you know, one kid said, I, you know, I'd really much prefer that toy than what I've got. And the other one thinks, no, I'd really prefer that card or whatever it is to the one I've got. They swap. And it's because they value things differently that they make the transaction, they make the exchange. It's not because they're all identical. If they were all identical and they all valued everything the same, they wouldn't exchange anything at all. So there wouldn't be any market. It's all this tripe about perfect competition and all this stuff. It really is tripe because there wouldn't be a market if there weren't differences between people. And the, and the, the wonderful thing about markets, over and above politics, is that we don't have to agree. In politics, we have to agree. You know, if, we, if we're going to, you know, if we're an electrician, we decide, well, what colour of uh, socks shall we produce? Well, we have a vote, and if 51% say blue, well, we produce blue socks. In our market, I can see, we've got socks of every, oh, good heavens, every possible, <laughs> every possible colour. We don't have to agree. Uh, and it's the fact that there are some bizarre ones uh, which make the, uh, the market work. Um, so, in politics, we've all got to be the same, we've all got to decide, or at least the minority has to go along with the majority. So if you're in the 49%, hard luck. You have to take what the majority want. In a market, we have a huge number of different offerings and styles and quality and price and, and whatever you like, uh, and it's for you to decide as, as, a, as a customer. So the, you know, what I'm really trying to tell you is that they tell you in school and university that uh, they give you this perfect competition model. Uh, they say, well, it's only an abstraction, it's not the real world. You bet it's not the real world. It wouldn't work if it was the real world. The whole point is that there are differences which make people trade. If there's no differences, if everything's perfect, you've got no reason to do anything. If this was a perfect world, none of us would do anything. I would stand here like this forever because it's perfect. Uh, but, it, but life isn't like that. And it's the imperfections that drive markets. Um, there are many imperfections in, in a market. Uh, there are things like information. Um, I didn't know where else I might go to get my uh, trousers repaired. Uh, I could have walked for half an hour. Tourists in London do walk for half an hour to try and find a restaurant because they just don't know which ones are the good ones, which ones are the bad ones, and they look through the window and they try to decide and then move on to the next one. We've all done it, and it's, it's a shortage of information, that's true. Uh, we don't know about price and quality. You know, when you do select your, your restaurant, you're not quite sure maybe how much you're going to be charged and whether the food's going to be any good. So there are kind of Search costs. You've got to, to have. A, you've got to spend time and effort looking around and all of these things. Yeah. And there are transaction costs as well. Uh, but uh, what what economists call transaction costs. That uh, it took me a little bit of time to bargain, if you like, with this uh, girl in Manchu. Um, we had a language dif difficulty, so I was trying to make her understand what I wanted, and she was trying to explain to me what she would do and how much. Cost and so it was slightly more difficult than if I'd just done it here in London, let's say, would have taken five seconds. Then it took a little bit longer. So there are these sorts of imperfections in the market. Markets aren't, aren't perfectly smooth, there are the little sort of uh, you know, lumpy bits in, in markets. Um, and another thing I think which comes out of my experience is just how much markets depend on trust. But there were, I did actually see other people who were um, doing needlework in Manchuria, and some of them were uh, old women who were sitting on the street on the corner, and there's probably about three or four of them, and they sit on the street in the sun, uh, mending clothes and, and doing things like that. And I thought, well, you know, should I go to this, those people? I don't know, really, because the fact that this girl had a, her own little booth and she obviously had clothes on the rack, she was clearly doing a, a reasonable trade. It just inspired me with a certain confidence that she must have a good stream of customers um, who trusted her work and I thought, well I might, despite the red thread, 
I, I thought I might actually get a decent job here, done here, whereas if I'd gone to the old ladies sitting on the street, just sitting on the pavement, um, I wasn't sure whether I would get a good job or not. So it was the fact that I could invest my trust in, in, in someone, which I think was extremely important. I paid my way to university through university partly by taking old antique prints and by uh, cleaning them, restoring them, painting them, and all the rest of it. And I went, uh, I had a, an antique dealer in Edinburgh who used to take a lot of my prints called Mr. Wildman, a nice man. And uh, um, one day I went in with this big map of Edinburgh, a uh, big frame map that I'd done. And I knew that it was more than 100 years old. But it was really, really clean and crisp. And Mr. Wildman, uh, the antique dealer, looked at this, you see, and, uh, and he said, I'm sorry, it looks too good to be true. And he said, motioned like that as if he wasn't going to, he, he didn't believe that this was 100 years old. And, and I assured him it was, and I said, I don't know where the book had come from, where I got it from, and, and all the rest, and how I knew it was 100 years old. I didn't want to carry it home, right? It was a big thing like this. Uh, so I wanted to make sure he bought it. And eventually, he, he took my word on it. Now, the reason that he was concerned is because he would be selling that to customers. And if I'd sold him a pup, and the customers had subsequently discovered that uh, they'd been sold an antique print which was actually a modern reproduction, well, he wouldn't have any customers for very long, would he? Because they would go around bad it, uh, and then he wouldn't be able to sell his uh, antique tables at 16,000 pounds, because people would say he's a cheat. Uh, similarly, uh, on the other side, he trusted me because I'd been in before, I saw him good good stuff, he knew that I knew my business, um, and he eventually, you know, he was skeptical at first, but he eventually, he, he decided, well, I've got trust in this person, I'm going to trust them. And without that trust, markets don't work at all. Markets aren't mechanical things. Markets are human institutions, and they've got all of the problems, that's why they're not perfect, because human beings aren't perfect, they've got all of the problems um, of uh, human beings, but they've also got all of the virtues, uh, and, and trust is, is one of those that's absolutely essential uh, to the market. Um, so, you know, competition, um, <coughs> markets, these things are not perfect. Uh, people are all different, but nevertheless, the process is still extremely effective. The markets adjust constantly uh, the demand of the public together with what people are prepared to produce and, and to sell. Um, and it's like every day, you know, every day you and I go out and we go into the shops and we buy things, you know, we might buy a cup of coffee or we might buy some clothes or, or, or whatever. We're doing that every minute of every day. And we're sending a message to suppliers of coffee and clothes and all of the other things uh, as to what it is that we want. Do we want cappuccino, do we want red socks or green socks or whatever. Uh, and it's a constant information flow. Now, you know, compare that with politics, where basically you get to vote once every five years, and you're voting for health, education, defence, welfare, foreign trade, you know, overseas aid, oh, you name it. Uh, you're, you're just given a package. You can't really express your uh, opinions. So the market is a way in which people can express their opinions every day, every moment of every day, and send a, an important message to, constant message to suppliers and producers of all of these things, all goods and services, uh, that tell them what we actually want. So it's a, it's a strange kind of order. It's, 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 it's a very orderly process. It's a very efficient process. It's a fantastic instant messaging service that sends information around the planet in no time flat as to what people actually want and what ought to be produced. Uh, but it's not something which is sort of consciously designed by human beings. It just depends, it's like a game, it just depends on everybody following the rules. The rules of property uh, and contract and all the rest of it. I had an implicit contract that I would get my, uh, nothing was on paper, but I had a contract to get my 
trousers is repaired. Um, I have the trousers were my property. I, I sort of knew I could trust this one wouldn't take my trousers and steal them. That's the base. That's the human basis on uh, which um, markets work. So I'm glad I tore up the diagram, and I hope that you've got some pleasure in it too. Uh, and uh, now I hope that I've explained how markets work. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Before we take the first one, I wonder, can we have a burst of air conditioning for a little while? It's getting a bit stuffy in here. So, yeah. Okay, anyway. Yes. Just there. Hi. Um, I also spent some time in China. And the situation that you had happens a lot, but also the opposite situation happens, where you hand over the money, the trousers get absolutely destroyed, and you still have to pay. And I think a lot of people have problems, particularly with services, but also with products, is that they're entering into the contract blindly. They're not guaranteed that they are going to benefit from the, the, the exchange. However, when you go to see a doctor or a lawyer, they have a certificate on the wall which is, reduces that risk, it guarantees more that there will be quality. So do you think markets would be more benevolent if that was the standard for all transactions, that there was a way of judging some sort of certification that tells you how good it is. And can that be done by the private, by the market itself, or does that need to be government regulated? If the attractive uh, young lady that I met in Lanzhou had to go and out and go to a training course and get a degree and not have a certificate behind her desk in order to do my trousers, I'm afraid that my trouser repair would have been unaffordable. <laughs> uh, and that's true of many other industries that uh, you, you, you can't afford this regularly. For, for small, simple transactions, you just do it. And, you know, sometimes they don't work. Uh, you know, we've all been to bad restaurants and all the rest of it, but you just say, well, right, I'm never going there again, and I'm going to tell my friends never to go there again. And that is the best form of regulation you could possibly get. Much better than having some bureaucrat up in, I've lost my sense of direction, but up in White Hall there, um, you're pouring over everybody and trying to say how they should run their, run their business and what they, should, what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Uh, very much more efficient. But you're right, the, the market does this sort of regulation automatically. Uh, you go to see um, a lawyer or an, an accountant or whatever, and uh, yes, they've got a certificate, but that's because they've decided that they are going to go through a certain training. Uh, that's expensive, they have to invest in it. Um, and uh, there may be societies which they uh, can join if they come up to a certain standard, and those societies will give them a sort of seal of approval. There are other ways of doing it. Um, for example, you may go to your lawyer's uh, solicitor's firm or whatever, and they may have a sign saying, you know, established 1932. In other words, that gives you confidence that they've been going a long time. They're not fly by nights, they're not going to do you over and then zip off to South America. Uh, they're there forever. And uh, similarly, they may have a big office, office block. They, they invest in a nice plush office, so it gives you the confidence that these are people who have invested in their business and they're not just going to uh, rush away. Uh, people may use celebrity endorsements for their products so that uh, you, the celebrity is risking their own reputation in endorsing them. So that again gives you the confidence. So the market has 101 ways of regulating. Um, only the least of which is customers being able to vote with their feet and go somewhere else. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, you just said that the market has got a few more ways to regulate that than the people do that. But at the very beginning of your talk, you said that the market is run by people, isn't it? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. You just yeah. said that the market, not the people, the market um, has 101 ways to control how people interact. Yes. But at the beginning of your talk, you said that the market is actually run by people. Yes. Doesn't that kind of contradict itself? Markets are people. Um, but then and what is it that they're facing? Yeah, it's uh, well, this is what I was sort of trying to explain just very, very briefly at, at the end, which is that. Uh, the market isn't, isn't a sort of structure that's imposed on everybody. 
it's something which evolves from our everyday actions. It's a bit like, um, if you can imagine, uh, the rules of grammar, right? Now we all follow, mostly follow, the rules of grammar because it helps us be understood if we talk in certain ways and we have discrete sentences and we use our verbs properly and all the rest of it. And it makes it easier for us to talk to each other because, because we can understand each other. But there's never been, except in France, I don't know if spelled it, uh, but it's, there's never been uh, any sort of agency that has laid down the rules of grammar. I'm sure there's powers bonding its usage and things like that, but they're not a, a sort of official thing. It's, it's not like that you've had a government department that says, right, we need some rules of grammar around here, and uh, here's an act of parliament saying what the rules of grammar are going to be. That's not how they grew up. They grew up because, you know, people like you and I, many thousands of years ago, were trying to communicate with each other, and, and with other people all over the place, and we found that if we used words in a certain way, then we could all sort of mutually understand each other, and then that would become a little bit more complicated, and so on and so on. So, nobody designed this process. It's a human process, but, but nobody designed it. It just evolves. Uh, and that's the, the joy of markets. They do evolve, and that's why they're so good at dealing with changed circumstances. If you've got something which is rigidly designed uh, by the French College of whatever it is, I don't forget what it is, uh, who, you know, who, who pontificate on the language, if it's rigid and things change, well, you know, that rule's no good anymore. Whereas markets, uh, because they're just human transactions, they change every day as people change. I hope that explains it. <laughs> My, my question was about um, the distinction between sort of micro and macroeconomics. In that your example of the, the Chinese food market um, was was very much a microeconomic example, um, possibly the most microeconomic example. And it's very easy to understand markets on that level, you know, without any kind of previous economic understanding, um, because of how simple they are. Um, and I, I did take great pleasure in looking up the uh, the kind of demand diagram. Yeah. But do you not feel that given the level of complexity in the international markets we live today and the multi-trillion dollar uh, global industries with, you know, the, the scale of market interactions that you, you can almost look at it in an aggregate level and you can um, derive a great deal of benefit from understanding how markets work without having to go to that kind of one-on-one -on -one level? I've got no doubt at all that there are certain patterns and regularities in the way markets work and in human life in general. Uh, from which you might draw some general conclusions about what's likely to happen tomorrow. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, all of those things are fundamentally based on the on, on those individual transactions by mind between individuals. And if individuals, for some reason tomorrow, start behaving differently, then I'm afraid that all your macroeconomic theory goes out of the window. Um, so, yes, there may be sort of macroeconomic patterns, uh, but, but they are all the result of individual transactions like, like that. And that's extremely important because in policy, you can make some really big mistakes. You can, for example, just you know, tweak a little tax law, and it just makes hundreds of thousands of people behave a little bit differently. And then that changes the entire uh, macro reality. And you may think, you, when looking at it, going through Parliament or whatever, you might think, oh, this is such a tiny tweak, you know, nobody will ever notice that. And then splat, you know, the whole thing goes, goes bad. And I think that's to some extent what's happened in the financial crisis. But that's a different story, which we'll hear about next. Yes. Uh, just here. Hi, I've got two questions. The first one is, uh, sort of something that Jamie White brought up, the uh, people that want the local butcher shop and don't like Tesco and so on, that there's almost a cognitive dissonance among, especially the left wing, who want the local stores and so on, go to the local stores maybe to look at the products and try them out, but then go on Amazon or the internet and then buy the cheapest thing they can, and then are suddenly shocked that these massive retailers come in. Why do you think there's the sort of, I don't know, cognitive dissonance is probably the best thing I can think of to describe that. And my second question is, as a 
as a very disgruntled economic student who also took great pleasure in ripping up that paper. What do you recommend? Because almost everything we do is this equilibrium analysis and so on. It's three years of, of doing that. So what would you recommend reading or, or doing instead? Well, I, I think to answer the, answer the first question, um, I don't really know. Uh, and I think that uh, people don't necessarily understand the the wider impact of their actions uh, and the fact that they don't shop at the local store means the local store is going to go bust. And I think they probably don't realise that. Um, I have this problem. I have, I have a house in Scotland on an island, and there is one uh, sort of central, central village. And most of the other shops in the other villages have closed down because everybody goes to the big shop in, in the main village. And everybody's complaining about how the local shops have. have Closed down, even though they, don't, they never actually patronised them. All. You know, they needed them kind of late at night when they were short of milk or whatever. But uh, uh, the, the patronage wasn't enough to keep them going. And I think people just don't understand the the impact of their individual actions on on, on the overall. And that's fair enough. Why should they? Um, to answer your second question, well, where do you go? Uh, I, I I think you should start looking at, if you can, uh, what's called the Austrian School of Economics, which is a school of economics that starts from this idea that you know, economics isn't about big mechanical, you know, your macroeconomic thing, big mechanical relationships. It's not like engineering or anything like that, uh, that, you know, increase demand and something else will happen, and unemployment will go down, and all this stuff. Um, it, it doesn't start from that. It starts from the evaluations of individuals, you know, how do individuals value things? Why do they exchange things? Why do they exchange things often in a very strange way? Um, and uh, starting from that sort of human needs and, and, uh, and values, uh, then, it, then they build it up into a, a, a sort of system of economics, or an approach to economics, I should say. Um, so most of the Austrian school is pretty, pretty dense and technical, but I think they are starting to get a bit more, um, uh, what's, what, what's the word, uh, accessible, I, I, I think. And there are some people out there, I don't know if you say Peter Burke and, and there are a few writers out there that I'm sure I could suggest um, who will give you some very interesting insights into how economics really does work. Um, question here, just a red tie. And actually on the Austrian economics, I think, one of the best writers is Steve Horitz, who writes for the Freeman Online, um, which is a project of Fee. And I think he writes a weekly article, which is not always just on economics, but um, very well explained. And there are other blogs like Coordination Problem, no, The Austrian Economist, I think it's called The Coordination Problem, yeah, yeah. and others. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Thank you. You talked a lot about trust in your speech, and you mentioned um, small scale. Transactions, but what would you say to someone who was affected by, say, the flash crash of last year, May 2010, where the market dropped by 9%, who wanted regulation of circuit breakers or regulation of rating agencies or insurance companies and things like that as a way of um, increasing trust in the market? Um, I, I don't want to step on the next speaker's. Toes. Uh, but it's it's my uh, all right. Yes, he he's got big enough toes. He can he can he can deal with it. Um, in my view, the financial crisis was caused entirely by government mismanagement and overregulation and bad government regulation. Um, and it's you know take for example the the rating agencies. Hmm. If you want to be a rating agency, um, then uh, you have to have certain but, but you've got to come up to US government standards of a certain sort. And, and that actually means that it's extremely difficult to become a rating agency. I mean, all of the stockbrokers and so on have their own analysts who, who did this job every, every day. But to be a rating agency like Standard & Poor's, you, you've got to have such high standards that there's darn few of them in the world. You, you can't, you know, there's this, what, about two or three that you can name. Um, in other words, there's no competition. And when there's no competition, you don't know where you're going to be. If there's competition and these guys mess up, 
well then somebody else will, will, will step in. So that's just an example. Um, and I, I suppose the same with banks. You know, there was a huge amount, still is a huge amount of regulation on banks. But the regulators were looking the other way. They were so busy getting the banks to fill out tick box forms about you know, how quickly do you pick up the phone to your customers. But they couldn't see the market was falling to bits. So they didn't do anything about it. So, you know, I would take the financial services agency, I would raise it to the ground, and I'd set a get a salt on the foundation so that nothing might grow there again. It's not the way to run your economy. Is there one more quick question? Shallow. Um, yeah, it's kind of related to what you just said. When you kind of get people criticise the market and say they're kind of alleged market failures and they kind of then like advocate government interventions as a solution to that, what would you kind of reply back to them? Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I wouldn't try and be defensive. What I would say is we need more competition. Competition is the best regulator. If people can simply up and up sticks and go to some other supplier, then every supplier has got to be on their toes. Every supplier has got to produce a, a good product at a low price uh, and, and be aware of their customers. So I wouldn't be defensive about it at all. I'd go out on the attack and say the, the problem isn't that we need more regulation. The problem is that we need a lot more competition. Why don't you, big government, just butt out and let that competition work? Thank you.